Hi, I'm Joaquin van Schoren and welcome back to our machine learning course. Um, so we've been looking at Bayesian learning and now we've, we've arrived at Gaussian processes, which are, objectively speaking, one of the coolest algorithms in existence. Uh, also one of the hardest to understand. So I'll do my best to explain to you what happens exactly. So Gaussian process is basically a series of points of a function, basically. Um, so given an input x, I want to break the output y. So it's going to be a function somewhere in this space. And I'm going to assume, again, because for Bayesian, we're going to assume that um, this distribution of possible functions is a Gaussian distribution. Right? And now I want to learn this distribution from the data, so some of these functions will become more likely than others. Right? In the beginning, I know nothing. I haven't seen a single observation for x, so my best guess is that x, the y is always zero. That's my mean, and I have a large variance around that. Could be any of these blue functions. Okay. Now things change if I make just one observation. So now I see, okay, x fifty five is corresponds to y of minus. 0.1-ish. Um, so I have the observation. Uh, and now the, the distribution of possible functions is going to change. Right? So that any function that would go here is very unlikely now. Only functions that go through this point or near this point are, are going to have high probability. Right? So my space of possible functions has drastically changed. And I'm, I'm very sure around what y is around this point. I'm still very unsure uh, about points further away from x equals 55. Okay. Even now at the second point, I again update using base rule. Uh, and now I can see I have, between those points, I have uncertainty, but the uncertainty is much less than anywhere else. Right? And around the points, I have very high certainty. In between, I have a bit less certainty. If I add more points, you will see what happens. It will update this model every time. And now, after some data points, I have learned basically what this function could still be. It could still be any of these blue functions, and even the ones that I haven't sampled. It could be somewhere even steeper. Um, but this is the distribution of the most likely functions through these points. Right. I can see I'm very uncertain here. I basically predict the mean again here. Um, any points in between here? Now, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm still very unsure here. Uh, here, I'm super sure it's going to be somewhere here. That's more often pretty much flat. Um, there's going to be uncertainty here, here, here. Now, much will depend on what I choose. This I, I need to choose some shape of this of these blue functions. Right. I'm going to assume, for instance, that it's. Um, um, like a kernelized um, function, like in, like in kernel regression, um, or I can I can also assume something like a logistic function or linear function. Um, if I add more points, you'll see it will learn, basically. And if I add a lot of points, it has basically learned pretty much what the shape will be. Okay, to, to make sure that you understand everything, let's do a quick recap of what we learned before about regression. So the first model we saw was a linear regression. In that case, our output y is simply a linear combination of our inputs x. And so we learn a set of weights w, so the dot product of w and x gives us y, okay, plus a bias. So for one feature, it means we learn uh, a weight w1 and a bias and then for any input value x we can predict the output y and it's going to be always linear okay now remember we we have a close form solution for that so we just have to do some linear algebra and that will give us our optimal values for w uh, in this case is x here that's our design matrix that is going to be um, our our feature x, the values for feature uh, x1, plus 
uh, a column of ones to learn the bias. But then if you do this, then we just have to compute this. That's like one line of code. And then I get my, uh, my optimal values W, my coefficients. An example for the Olympic marathon data. So this is, I don't remember exactly. I think this is like average run, average times for the marathon. I don't remember. So every year we take uh, this observation and we see it gradually goes down, but not entirely linearly. So you want to learn uh, this function here. Uh, if we take linear regression, then the best thing we can do is learn uh, this line, which has a slope, downward slope of 0 0.013 and an intercept at 28.9. Okay, we can then uh, do basis expansion, right? So we can, next to x, we can add the squares of x and the, the interactions between them and so on, right? Um, so we can use any basis expansion phi, and now we can learn polynomial models, which fit the data a bit nicer. And then we also saw kernelization, right? So instead of uh, <clears throat> finding a model and a bunch of w's and learn the w's, we can also learn a w, uh, we can learn do coefficients for every point. And then our model becomes a combination of, 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 of uh, these. So we choose a kernel, like polynomial. In this case, we get the blue line. Uh, if we use RBF kernels, then uh, it's going to be some complex function uh, that, well, responds to all the due coefficients we've learned for every data point. Um, we have to choose a number of high parameters, though, like, for instance, for RBF. We have to choose the width of the gamma. So this is log scale. So even making gamma a bit too small will make the model very simple and almost the same as polynomial. Making it too large, which means you get very narrow Gaussians. You get a very complex model, very much overfitted, right? And alpha, our, our um, regularizer, that's also going to have a huge effect. Well, I'm not so much sure. I guess it's going to have to be smaller. Oh, yes. OK, so you have to choose these high parameters very carefully to get a good model. Well, that's a bit annoying. And we'll see that Gaussian processes don't have this problem so much. In Gaussian processes, we do have to choose a kernel, but the parameters are learned by the model themselves. Okay, so far uh, we have no probabilities. We just get one prediction and that's it, right? So if I want to know okay, what's the prediction for 2020, it will give me one number and actually those two models will give me a very different number. They don't give me any uncertainty, which they should, right? Because those models can't be very sure about the future. They haven't seen any data there yet. And looking at these models, it could be anywhere from here to here, right? So ideally a model should tell us something like um, the mean is going to be here and there's going to be some standard deviation around there. Right. That's something we want to learn. So to do that, so we have to we have to build a, a probabilistic version of regression. The simplest way to do that, well, first of all, we assume data is going to be inherently uncertain. What that means is that if I look at a data point, I'm um, going to assume that I should not take that value too seriously. I'm going to assume that it's some kind of uh, small distribution around this point. Right, so if I have this point here. Oh, let's let's look at this point here, 2020. So no, let's let's look at this point here. Right? Um, I'm going to assume that this point is actually distributed like this. There's probably some noise around this point. Um, which is Gaussian. So I'm going to assume that the, the actual distribution of this point is some Gaussian around that. Right. Um, 
I'm going to represent it by a slight variable eta here, and which is also called a noise variable. Right? So we assume that there's some noise in our data represented by E. And we're going to assume that this noise is going to be Gaussian distributed, right? which gives me again this Gaussian distribution. Um, which means that now my model is actually a Gaussian distribution with mean wx, w dot product x, uh, and variance, the variance of my noise. Right. This looks a bit like this. Right? So I, I learn my linear line tree here, plus there is some uncertainty interval depending on how much noise I assume to be in the data. This will change. If I, if I assume there's a lot of noise, there will, will have many well, quite uncertain predictions. If I assume that there's very little noise in my data, uh, the, the uncertainties are going to be tighter. Okay. Now, there's different ways to learn this. Um, and you've probably heard about this before. Um, let's just briefly go over these. So the first way of doing it is called um, maximum likelihood estimation. And this is basically what we've been doing all along. Um, so whenever, so what we do is we want to maximize the probability of data given the Ws. So you want to learn Ws so that our data becomes maximally likely, right? So say I had this, these points here, and I learned a W, a W will give me a line like this, right? So this is defined by W. Um, now I can compute, okay, what's the probability of my data given this W here? Well, it's good. Well, the, the data points are going to be pretty unlikely given W here, right? So and that means my Ws are badly chosen. I, really, I choose a W so that my model goes nicely through these points. So the probability of my data given this W is very large. And what is that? It's nothing else than just optimizing the log likelihood as loss function. So this is exactly what we've been doing before. We choose loss function, we minimize that, and then we get the optimal Ws. Right. What does what these predictions look like? Well, the probability of x given w is the sum of the probabilities for every data point x. Right. So, um, the probability of all my data given w is going to depend on the probability of every individual data point given the prediction y. So if many points uh, are far off the line, then um, this will be low. Right? And we, take, we just take the product of all of these guys. Okay, since this here is the probability of, so say this is a zoom in here, I have a point, this is my uh, line defined by W. And so Y given X, and W is going to be some distribution around here. Right. So like I like I had here, right? So it's some like if I cut through here, it's some distribution around the mean. Sorry my pediment scale not quite. Yeah, some distribution around this mean here. Okay. So likewise here. Um, so this is in fact Gaussian distributed. It's a Gaussian distributed centered at Wx and defined by the, the noisiness. All right. That's the first thing to do things. This is basically what we're doing all along. We choose the loss function, we optimize the loss function. Uh, but with the added benefit that now I, I kind of assume that this is going to be a distribution around that defined by the prediction, optimized for the loss function and some noise. 
That's pretty straightforward. Another thing we can do is uh, map or maximum posterior estimation. And in this case, the opposite. We maximize the posterior, the, pro the, the probability of W given X. Right. And we can do that using base rule. Uh, so in this case, we have to choose a prior. So we can we could do MLE without the prior. For map, we do need to choose a prior W. So and the prior W is going to define the shape of functions that we're going to assume. In this case, they're going to be all linear. Right. So yeah, the Ws are well. Typically, we do, we just choose this prior to be a Gaussian distributed a Gaussian distribution. Something like, um, if I draw that, it would look. So that way. Uh, it will basically be a Gaussian distribution. Um, so some value here. So this is my space of Ws, W1, W2. And I'm going to assume that um, models with low Ws are better. Um, so my prior is going to be somewhere um, sample, some, some Gaussian distribution around zero. Right? So I could, in fact, choose any distribution I want. But I'm just going to assume Gaussian distribution because they will have very nice properties. OK, we'll see that in a minute. And so yeah, now we can do map. So our posterior uh, is defined by the probability of x given w, and we already know how to compute that, uh, times the prior, which we chose, times normal, uh, well, divided by normalizer. This is nice, but I still don't really have uncertainties. Um, I had, and I have to choose a shape of, um, I have to choose a, a shape for the w's. Now the Bayesian guys, the Bayesian approach would say, hold on, why do I actually need to choose a W? So I'm only going to learn the W's to then give a prediction. Right? The only reason why I come I learn W's is to make predictions at the end. So why not model the predictions directly? So the prediction of probability of y given the data x and a test point x test, now given probability for y. So what you can do, you can actually, turns out you can actually just marginalize, marginalize out the w. You can marginalize out the model. You can assume the space of all possible models, some are likely than others, but you're going to marginalize that out. Right, so what you do, so this probability, so probability of the prediction, the probability of these predictions is going to be this integral, integral over all possible models of you. Um, so yeah, so PX test depends here on W, and this is W X given Y, uh, y W given X. And let's see what this looks like, right? So W, so the, 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 the probability of W given X is this guy. What kind of distribution is this? Well, it's the, the, the probability of, of uh, Ws, and we've already chosen this to be a Gaussian prior. We also know that this guy, remember the probability for y given some value x is also a Gaussian. So it's a Gaussian times a Gaussian and a normalized. So this is Gaussian. So this guy here is Gaussian. And this, we've already figured out that's the same as here, right? This is also a Gaussian. And then we marginalize this, and this will still be a Gaussian. So what we've learned from this is that 
the, the, probability, the distribution of the predictions is actually a Gaussian distribution. And it's pretty amazing, right? And this it also means that you can actually make this assumption on good grants. You can actually assume that given that I choose a Gaussian prior, then my prediction, the, the distribution of my data is also going to be a Gaussian. And so the only thing I need to do is to learn this Gaussian distribution. I have to learn a mean and I have to compute um, a covariance matrix. Once I do that, I have learned my data. Note that this depends on, on the Gaussian prior. If the, if the prior is not a Gaussian, then this whole thing falls apart um, and you can't make any assumptions about your data. So yeah, it's, it's good to choose a Gaussian prior. Okay, let's now take this step by step. First of all, we have uh, a Gaussian prior. Or prior, a prior over the, the Ws, the, the space of models. So some models are going to be more likely than others. Yeah. And we assume that uh, the distribution of these models, the Ws, is going to be no distributed around zero with some variance alpha. Um, so it will have zero mean and covariance alpha. In 2D, that would mean that my mean is actually a vector of two zeros. And my variance is going to be shown, could be represented by a covariance matrix alpha times i, which looks like this. Uh, and then I can I can sample from the distribution. Right? So the distribution looks like this. So I have the space of my weights w. And um, my alpha, so my covariance matrix, defines the shape of this function. That's the main thing. So the, 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 the mean defines where the center is. That's not so interesting. Uh, and um, the covariance matrix defines the shape of this function. If I choose alpha to be very small, then this, function, this, uh, this distribution is going to be very steep, very, very narrow. If I make alpha very large, then the distribution will be very wide. Okay. Um, we'll see in a minute what happens if we also change these other values. But if if our distribution is like nicely like this, then the shape will also be like a nice Gaussian uh, mountain here, or nicely circular um, in the in the contour version. All right. So this is my Gaussian prior. So I now have a distribution over my Ws. I have a distribution over the space of possible models. And, and I, I can now sample from this. Okay. What does that look like? Let's find out. Um, so I can sample from this distribution. This is the same distribution as before, right? It's here. So it's, uh, it's centered around, around zero and it has some certain uh, variance. I can now sample from the distribution. So if I take different random repeats, I will get different points, and these will all be sampled from the distribution. So they're more likely to be in the center and less likely to be anywhere else. And there are uh, different ways to do that. For instance, you can use a box Muller transform to sample from the distribution. Typically, this is already implemented in uh, most uh, libraries for you. Okay, so a sample from distribution. So every sample I take, like take this red point here, gives me a value for W1 and gives me a value for W2. And if this is not 2D but 5D, I will also get values for W3, W4, and W5. Given these Ws, I can now plot a function. Right? Remember that our functions f were defined by w times sum of transformation phi over x. 
right, so let's say that phi is polynomial and the degree is five, then we learn five weights. Well, we sample a point here, which will give me five weights because the five dimensional distribution, which will give me this red curve. So this red, red point corresponds to this red curve. And any other point in this weight space, like this bright blue one, so this one will give me this one. The, the, the green and blue one here will be this one. So any point a sample here uh, is going to be a function. And so the shape of my distribution here is going to have an effect on the shape of the functions there. Right? So if I choose a lower degree, well, if I use one, it's going to be a linear. Just a distribution of linear models. Two degrees, it's a bit more flexible. Five, to eight degrees, it's very flexible. Um, alpha, remember that was the width of our, our distribution here. If I make that larger, then this becomes wider and these functions will vary a lot more. If I make this very small, then my samples have to come close to the mean, which means my w's are all going to be almost zero. And if all my w's are almost zero, well, then my lines here, even if they're polynomial, will be very close to zero as well. Right. And this probably won't have much effect at all. Yeah. So these are, this is a priors. This is a prior distribution before I see any data. This is a prior distribution of my models. Right. And so now I'm going to basically learn what the right distribution is. This is the prior, and now I learn the posterior after I see data. Okay, so we assume that our data is going to be Gaussian distributed. So now we want to learn mu and the covariance matrix. Uh, and say that I learned that. Let's just jump ahead and say I, I magically know the, the mean and covariance. So the mean is defined by, well, this can be different, but let's just, for the sake of plotting, assume that it's the same. Then my mean is somewhere here. So changing the mean changes the, the center of this distribution. Alpha, as we saw, defines the width. So if you make it smaller, then it's going to be uh, more narrow. Beta here uh, is the covariance. It tells me how much uh, knowing x or x test here tells me about y. So if it's zero, then knowing x doesn't tell me anything about y. So say I, I choose so I can change X test. And so here in the blue, I can see uh, the prediction. That's the blue curve here. That's my prediction I wanted to learn. Right, that's the same guy as I, I, I draw before. I have a function and so for a given x, this is some distribution. So distribution like this. Okay. <clears throat> and this one, that's my blue line here, right? So it's, it's going to be a Gaussian ransom mean. Now, if you see, if I keep beta at zero, so the covariance here is zero. We call alpha the variances and, and B beta the covariances. If I change test, this doesn't tell me anything about Y. Y is always going to be a distribution around zero here. Right. So if the covariance is zero, <clears throat> um, that doesn't tell me anything about Y. However, if beta tends to be different, let's make it very large. See now, if you can see it maybe better here, it's, it looks like this. If I make beta negative, it goes in the other direction. So 
so if beta is positive, then s as x test gets larger, then y will also get larger. Right? So we see here if we increase x test, then y the distribution for y also the mean also becomes larger. Right? If, if I make x test smaller, then you can also see this goes to the left. So y also gets smaller. Uh, if beta is negative, it's the opposite. So that be, mean that if my covariance is negative, it means that if I increase x test here, then y would go down. So it looks like this. So now if I increase x test, y will go down. If I decrease x test, y goes up. Okay, so basically what, 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 again to recap, what we want is to learn the mean and especially to learn this covariance matrix. If we know that, then we're done. Then we can make all kinds of predictions. Okay. Um, yeah, so I uh, already explained most of this. So if two, if two variables covariate strongly, so I explained this here for x test and y. This is the same for two random variables. Um, so if I take a positive uh, covariance, then knowing x tells me something about where x1. This tells me something about where x2 would be. Right? If I um, and vice versa, if I know x2, this will tell me more about where x1 will be. The red curve here and if beta will be zero then yeah this is all <laughs> around the mean it's around zero here so knowing x1 doesn't tell me anything really where x2 is and vice versa knowing x2 doesn't tell me anything about where x1 is it's always going to give me a distribution around mean zero Okay, so this is in 2D. I have two variables, x1, x2. And I learn distribution over these two points. Right? So knowing the value of x1, I can now tell something or not about x2, depending on the covariance. <clears throat> What happens if I go to higher dimensions? So, still in 2D, uh, I, I can sample points from the distribution. Right? And for now, let's assume that my covariance looks like this. Okay? So, I can sample from the distribution in 2D. Any point I sample here, I could also plot in a different way. So for this orange point, I see x0 is minus 0.25 and x1 is 0 0.5. So this gives me the value for x0, the value for x1. So this red point, this, sorry, this orange point becomes two points here. So one point is over here. And So what, um, yeah, so x, one point is over here, that's my value for x0, and also the value for x1, and that's my point here. And now I can interpolate between them, and now I have a function. So I choose a point <clears throat> in this space of x's and, and I'll get a function for two. It's just a <laughs> very simple function. That's it. And the covariance here is um, so um, it's just one one zero zero here. Right? 
Okay, what happens if I go to more dimensions? So if I go to tree, I cannot plot this anymore, but I can still plot the rest. Right. So if I go to tree, or oh, no, let's, let's not jump too far. Let's go to tree. So now I have <clears throat> three points. One, two, three. And my covariance matrix also has three points now. Again, the covariance matrix. Still, so this is still uh, the, the, the identity. Right, so knowing, because it's, it's, this means it's purely random. So knowing, uh, x, knowing the first point zero, does mean nothing about x one, x two. It's just purely random. Right. If I choose more points, again, I keep going random points, and so my functions would just be completely random. The only thing that I can learn from this. Is it's some random uh, function around zero because they're all still around zero. Okay. Now, instead of using this identity, I can also choose any um, basis um, expansion, phi. So, what happens if I choose? Let's have a linear, like just a linear one. Okay. Now, if this is linear, or it's just dot product, right? Um, then my co my uh, covariance matrix K is alpha times um, a base expansion times or well, five times five uh, transpose. Or well, it's the dot product of these two actually. Yeah. So it's it's just a dot product between these two and that, that gives me this covariance matrix okay now what happens if um yeah so let's start again in two dimensions so if i would plot this actually just to make sure you get this okay yeah let's start so this is in 2d so now we have a linear, um, so x1 depends linearly on x2. Oh, sorry, x0 depends, or x1 depends linear, uh, linearly on uh, x0. So it's linear like. Uh, like this. Okay. Um, I choose one point in the space, the orange one, and again, this, this gives me two points, and I can draw a line between them. Now I go to three dimensions, or no, four or five, whatever. And again, my covariance matrix is now equal to the size of the data points. But my lines remain linear. See? No matter how many dimensions I add, my lines will remain linear. And that's because I, I have a covariance matrix that's defined by this linear transform. Let me just, um, if that's maybe not so intuitive, let's look at what's happening here. So if you look at this value, it's for zero. If you would plot the covariance, versus x, what would that be? It's high here, it's, it's you know, one here. And 0 0.8 here. So and it goes down linearly. So this actually does this. So knowing point zero, like this point here, does me de linearly decreasing uh, about the other points. So this means that all the other points. To this so they will be on the line as so this covariance matrix if these values go down linearly then this line here will also be linear okay of course you don't have to choose linear you can choose a polynomial as well 
in that case, um, what does this look like on this first line here? Of course, this is going to be a polynomial. So it's going to not agree stingily, but like, yeah, <laughs> like a polynomial. Right. So before we had linear, now we have polynomial. So knowing the point at zero, well, it will have, an, it will have a larger effect on the nearby points, but almost no effect on the, lar the further points away. So that's polynomial. Right. So this covariance matrix here. So you only have to choose uh, a transformation phi, and this will give me my covariance matrix. And I can then sample from a Gaussian distribution and get a space of possible functions. So if I choose more dimensions, I get more points here. So this is the space of possible functions that I have. And this is defined by the covariance matrix. So far, this is still our prior, right? So we haven't looked at any data yet. But our prior space of functions is going to be um, well, look, it, it looks like this. So it's a, it's a bunch of uh, polynomial functions. Okay. So and so we call f a stochastic process. So it's a series of points. Like remember that this polynomial, while it looks smooth, it's actually just an interpolation of some sample points. Thanks for all to get there. And so that's the that's stochastic process. We choose a number of, uh, so we have a, a series of values, one, two, three, four, five, which are ordered in time. Uh, or can you, I think, so they're ordered in time here. And basically what we get is a series of values. So you can see that this is actually not a smooth curve. It's a number of points, and this is exactly what a stochastic process is. It's a series of knownly distributed variables, and this will give me then this plot here. And the more values I choose, the more this will look like a smooth uh, polynomial. And so it's it's a it's a space of functions that's defined by Gaussian distribution with mean zero and covariance matrix K, which depends on my chosen uh, base transform. Now there's one more thing we need to add, and that's our noise, right? So our actual predictions Y were our predicted functions F plus some noise eta, and so we can you, you can, we can do that by just choosing a value for sigma, like the noise level. If you make it very small, then this will look very much like the original polynomials. If it's large, then this will be very chaotic. And you can also see the effect on the covariance matrix. So here it looks pretty much as before. If I choose a large sigma, so a high noise level, you can see that um, get this, this <laughs> band in the middle here. And so what that tells you is that knowing the value for a point tells you much less uh, about the nearby point. So before we had uh, this was the polynomial one, right? So we go down like this. Now, 
if you have high noise, it will go down faster initially and then again on normally. Right, so we've come a long way. We've learned basically how to define a space of possible functions and then to sample from there, sample functions from it. Now we want to add one more ingredient, and that's what we want our functions to be smooth. If two points are similar or nearby, we want relations to also be similar. Right? And hence we need a similarity measure, which we also know as a kernel. And in the Gaussian process, we enforce this by specifying the covariance directly. Before, we were specifying the covariance based on some uh, transform, some uh, basis transform, some basis expansion. In Gaussian processes, we're going to say, well, the covariance is just the kernel I gave it. So I choose a kernel, like, like an RBF kernel, like a Gaussian kernel. And that's going to be our covariance matrix. Okay. So I no longer have to choose a uh, base transform. I just use a kernel instead. Um, well, we've, we've already seen the RBF kernel. Uh, it looks a bit different here because this is pairwise. So we're going to have uh, some difference between x and, and given x and a new point x prime. Uh, and then we divide it by, in this case, uh, L, which is the, the, the length. The length scale, uh, which is similar to gamma, uh, and then times alpha, which is the, the vertical scaling, the vertical variation. Okay. Yeah, and that, that gives us our kernel, and now we can define uh, our covariance matrix. So this is the covariance matrix for the RBF kernel. If you draw that, then well, let's take a point here. So if I draw that, then the covariance is like this. It's high here, and then exponentially goes down both sides. So that's the covariance matrix for um, the RBF kernel. So now we can, as usual, sample from this. Um, so I choose an alpha, I choose length scale, I choose a number of dimensions, and again, I can start with two dimensions. And now I can plot this in 2D, and I can see, yeah, we're sampling from this Gaussian distribution. Remove the clutter. Um, and so any point I sample here will give me two points here. So that's not interesting. Um, let me sample in higher dimensions. So five or more. And now I can see what this what these functions look like. They look exactly like kernel ridge, right? So they're very flexible models that can quickly adapt, but they're still very smooth. And again, you can you can change these high parameters, like you can change the length scale, like if I make that wider, this will be more smooth, more flat. So the more I increase this, the flatter they get. If I make it smaller, they will be very jumpy up and down. And alpha is again is a width, so making alpha larger. Well, it just changes the yeah, so it just changes the the scale here. It's the vertical variance. So if I make alpha small, these functions will vary between zero and two. If I make uh, alpha larger, then these functions will vary between 0 and maybe 4 or 5. So they will be going much more up and down. Okay. All right, that's it. Um, 
yeah, now we now we know what the shift function is like. So it's still mean. The mean is still zero, right? And um, the, the 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 covariance matrix is defined by the kernel we choose. Now we have one more thing to do, and now we want to condition this on our training data. Okay, this is still our prior. Um, so a prior, like I saw before, right? So it's a mean around zero, and, and otherwise it could be any function around that. Okay, now comes the mathy part. Um, so we're going to use base rule uh, to compute the posterior. So the first step, this is just base rule. Um, so probability of y given x is probability of x given y times the prior over the y's times y over the x's. And turns this if you do, if you uh, use the, the Gaussian kernel, the Gaussian density, uh, this is going to be the shape of your uh, posterior. You can look up the exact derivation, but it's basically well this is pretty so this is our um covariance which is k. Remember, we add noise to that. And then to compute the, uh, the, the shape of, the, of this distribution, we have to invert that and then multiply it by x and x transpose. And then we normalize it this way. Which means that we can now compute the negative log likelihood. Uh, so we, we, over this, right? This is a likelihood. Now we do the log. And this, this gives us this. Uh, and so we have some things to choose, like uh, the noise level, uh, sigma here, and also the, ver the properties of the kernel matrix, like the length scale and the variance. And instead of choosing these beforehand, we're just going to embed them in the covariance matrix. We're going to make them part as extra variables in the covariance matrix, and we can just learn them from data as well. Okay, now you want to learn this objective, and once we've done that, we have our um, uh, distribution, our posterior distribution that we can sample again uh, points from and uh, functions from. Some good news is that this can be optimized using any algebra, um, just some uh, matrix decomposition, uh, better known as the Koleski decomposition. Bad thing is, well, remember what K looks like. K was this guy. So it's a matrix of dimensions n by n, n being the number of data points. So this is an n by n, this is an n by n matrix. And we are going to have, well, while well, adding the, the noise, just, just still an n by a matrix. And then we have to infer that guy. And that's going to be expensive. And in fact, um, doing this is cubic, both in the number of data points and in the number of dimensions of your data. So it's expensive. <laughs> um, so in reality, um, just doing this, will often not scale beyond maybe 100 features, maybe even less than that. If you have millions of data points, you probably won't be able to even keep this in memory or somehow. It, this, this matrix is going to be so huge that it's going to slow down everything by a lot. Okay, But in, if, if you still have small data sets and not too high dimensional, uh, this is a very useful uh, model to use. Okay, now how do you make predictions? Well, um, so we make predictions for f unaffected by uh, future values for f. So if you think of f star as test points, we can again assume this is going to be again be a normal distribution and again around zero. Uh, so we have the same mean as before. And the, co the, the covariance matrix is now 
mainly turn OK. And for our new points, um, the covariance matrix, well, the combined one, look like this with uh, this K star transpose being the curl matrix uh, computed between the training points and the test points, and it's the same here. So this is KT. And this guy here, that's the kernel matrix between all the test points and themselves. Right. So if they, are, if they only have one test point, this will be like a single row, this will be a single value. Uh, if you have a larger test set, then this could be larger. Okay. And this is basically how I make predictions. So if you want to know predictions for uh, points we haven't seen yet, um, we just use our kernel to compute kernel star and kernel star star. And then we then this distribution. We know the distribution, we know the posterior distribution of our data. And now we can sample from that. Um, I have to make this conditional uh, to answer some questions of interest, right? So here I, I know my posterior distribution. Now to make, uh, to plot, I need to ask, okay, what's the situation if X is uh, 2000, for instance, right? And for that, I need the conditional uh, density. Um, and you, you, the, the, uh, I'm not going to do the full derivation, but this is the result. So the mean would be K star transpose K plus this guy, and the covariance is going to be this guy. Um, yeah, so you, you, this, you can just look this up, right, and then use it. What does it mean in practice? So if I have no points, I again, I have this situation, which is the same as what I have here, right? Exactly the same. This is our prior. Now we're going to see our first data point and see what happens now. Okay, now I know the y value for this one. So the, the new distribution is defined by this covariance matrix. So around this point, we have very low uncertainty, very low covariance. Right. Knowing this point doesn't tell me too much about the points nearby. This is goes this goes steeply up, right? Uh, points on the diagonal, uh, they're still around uh, to me here. If I add more points, that you will see. For every point, I see, you can see how the, the covariance goes to zero around these points. So it, it still tells me in this direction, this direction, but around this, this will be zero. So, yeah. And I can add more points. And every time I can see how the covariance matrix updates. So where the, where the variances are large, I have a large uncertainty. And in between, I have very low uncertainty. And every time I recompute my covariance matrix using this formula here, and this will be the result. Pretty cool, right? Um, always amazes me. Okay. Um, now remember that um, our prediction is the sum of the mean and the variance. So so far, I was still assuming zero mean. Okay. Now I'm going to add the mean, and what happens if I decouple them? So this is my mean. And this, by the way, is exactly the same solution as you would get from kernel rich, using the same kernel and the same high parameters. This is my uncertainty around zero, which is defined by the covariance matrix. 
and adding the two gives me my final model. Um, oftentimes, we're not interested in all these functions. We just want to see the uncertainty. And so if we look at this diagonal here, this tells me exactly the variance. Right? On the diagonal, I have the covariance between a point and another point, and the variance between the point and itself. Um, and so if I look at the diagonal, this will tell me the uncertainty. So it's high here, then very low here, a bit higher here, low here, very high here. And then we have nothing else here, and then again some uncertainty at the end. And so we see here, um, this is what happens if we just plot, if we just don't plot the, the functions and we only plot the mean and the, the variance. We get this. Right, so this is pretty much what we want to see, typically. Um, I, get, I can start from zero points, in which case I know nothing. I can add a point. Oops. And yeah, so very low uncertainty here, and very large uncertainty there. You can see the mean goes down to zero again. And as I have more points, this updates. And we have our nice holistic predictions. Uh, the length scale can still be a parameter, which has an effect on the kernel matrix. So if I play with that, it also has an effect. Like if I make it small, you get very sharp. Uh, uncertainty rises here. If I make it very flat, then it will look like this.